You heard the Morgan Stanley call that, yes, th this is going to add a more of a rate uh, risk premium when it comes to Chinese equity markets. But long term, they're thinking this could lead to more sustainable growth in China. How are you viewing it? Well, I, I think um, that's not an unreasonable assumption, which is um, in, in the longer term, you do rebalance uh, a lot of things in the economy, especially uh, to do with inequality and so on and so forth. Uh, there's another dimension to this, which is uh, somewhat more worrying in the medium term, though. Uh, and that's really the question uh, that a lot of private enterprises and private investors would be asking themselves, which is uh, to what degree would, uh, whether it's the enterprise assets uh, or revenues be uh, to some degree subject to, to state appropriation if they don't follow uh, not always clear rules. So the, the opacity around this uh, could give rise to a little bit of setback. And, and the remedy around this is to be really transparent in terms of where regulation is and where it's headed. Uh, and then the longer term benefits, I think, become a lot more uh, tangible and a lot less volatile. The, the path towards that becomes a lot less volatile. Yeah, uh, Vishnu, Ivan and I were just talking earlier. We're on a seven-week streak <laughs> as far as the rally in Chinese government bonds are concerned. They, we obviously know that that change in monetary policy that they uh, that they implemented a few weeks back. Do you think that was early enough to save EM a few months from now? I, I think to some degree uh, that would certainly be be entire uh, be, be be very helpful uh, to to stave off some of the headwinds, but. Uh, the bigger risk here is that we are unable to uh, project or quantify the kind of uh, the kind of credit risk premium uh, that could ripple through these markets. I mean, one of the biggest areas is, uh, and, and, and here's why it's particularly worrying, it's worrying because we are unsure how the interaction between these risks play out. Uh, there's been some easing on the monetary front, but it's not entirely clear because there's still credit tightening with respect to some sectors, particularly uh, property. If that catches the regulatory uh, clamp down wrong-footed, then that kind of uh, credit, uh, credit uh, risk repulse uh, could create a greater uh, risk aversion and capitulation of funds out of EM Asia. And, and that would be the real worry around this. Right. And, and so do you think we're about to get these inflation numbers out of China as well? I mean, PPI prices still look pretty red hot. Is that going to prove to be a problem for policymakers in mm. China? Can bond traders continue to price in additional policy easing? I think this one is, is uh, an easier question from within the regulatory part because uh, to some degree, I think China's high uh, factory gate inflation is misperceived. Uh, to a large extent, we view two things around this. One is China's uh, industrial sector has got a lot of capacity to absorb costs along the way, particularly since now it's a lot more value added today than it was 10 years ago. Uh, so that that segment of it is able to absorb a lot of this cost, which is why the very upstream input cost uh, PPI is a lot higher than the uh, closer to end product merchandise goods uh, PPI. And the best part of this is China not only is able to contain CPI within the country, but is also exporting uh, disinflation uh, to the rest of the world. So that aspect of it, I'm, I'm less worried in, in terms of it being a dilemma for policymakers. It, that's a lesser concern for me. Price action today, dollars up, yields, well, if they were trading, uh, would, would be up today. Real yields are down. Uh, is the dollar about to rebound sustainably from here? Well, I think we've been thinking the dollar was bound for, uh, bound for uh, that's a very bad phrase, thing, but bound for rebound uh, this year. Uh, but that was premised on somewhat uh, rather presumptuous things like uh, what you just referred to. One of the things we, we, we uh, you know, premised it on was real yields rising, which hasn't actually happened unequivocally. In fact, real yields have taken a step back. But despite that, dollar could still outperform in so far that we remain on a fairly steady track to taper. Um, and in so far that Fed and the US are seen outpacing uh, the rest, uh, particularly given the, the kind of China risks that are developing around EM Asia. Uh, the, the thing around this, however, is we, we want to get a good grip on when real yields will pick up uh, because that's the kind of support that the dollar needs to sustain this. And, and it just goes to show, I mean, I mean, we were just talking about how the Delta variant is really something that's hitting EM Asia. It's, it's starting to come up in the U.S. as well. Is that going to derail what you're saying is a smooth path to tapering for the Fed? For the, for the Fed, I, I think they're in a slightly different position, uh, primarily because 
uh, they started on a much better footing with vaccinations. I mean, we, we all agree that uh, those were the low-hanging fruits and maybe uh, getting vaccinations much higher is going to be rather tough. However, I, I think the U.S. started on a different note. And, and so they need not perhaps be as affected as EM Asia, which has had very low vaccination rates uh, and hence as a compensation required much more stringent uh, lockdown or restriction measures in response to the Delta outbreak. So the Fed, by and large, we think will remain on its taper path. There could be some delays to this. And, but the thing here is, uh, even without Delta, I think the uh, tapering process would have been a lot gentler, uh, given that it does then fit with the flexible average inflation targeting and a, and a more insurance-based approach uh, to monetary policy, whereas EMA is in a very difficult and, and different position. Yeah, and can you tell us more on that? Because you've drowned, downgraded pretty much everything that you cover. I'm holding the paper here. It's kind of depressing. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, uh, the caveat here is um, I'm somewhat more miserable than the average human being on the spectrum, so <laughs> do take it with a pinch, pinch of salt. Uh, but here's right. our thought. Our, our thought is it's not so much uh, a catastrophic, uh, uh, you know, outcome-changing event uh, insofar as if we take a medium-term three- to five-year perspective on it. However, we cannot uh, turn a blind, blind eye to the fact that hopes of a recovery this year have pretty much been pushed out. I mean, apart from China, that's, that's you know, more than made back up. Uh, the rest of EM Asia, a lot of ASEAN is looking like a very full recovery would only come through soundingly in 2022. Uh, and that would be coincident with uh, vaccinations getting up and the economies being able to open up in a more unfettered way and in a steadier fashion. Uh, and, and I think that's when uh, we, we see it opening up. However, for EM Asia, uh, the unfortunate thing may be that it, it may then not, it may still be somewhat stifled because of potential taper headwinds at a point when the economy is opening up and, and, and starting to pick up again.